Wherever in the world you are joining us from right now, hello and welcome to the first ever Industry Tech Days presented by All About Circuits. I'm Dave Finch, host of Moore's Lobby, the podcast by engineers for engineers. And today is Monday, August 31st, and we have an incredible show for you this week. Uh, 50 live technical sessions, hundreds of hand-selected technical articles to supplement those sessions. Uh, We're giving away development boards, t-shirts, an industrial-grade 3D printer, uh, and you get access to all of this really great content live or on demand, so you can attend at your own pace. And uh, speaking of access, Industry Tech Days is all about peer-to-peer learning as a community of engineers. So this week, you can connect with literally thousands of engineers, leading manufacturers, and even our keynote speakers in real time via chat. In other words, uh, this is not your typical online conference, uh, but it does. I'll kick off right now. And uh, our first keynote speaker joins us this morning from Seattle, Washington. Richard Berry is Senior Principal Engineer at Amazon Web Services and the founder of Free RTOS, the market-leading and freely distributed real-time operating system for microcontrollers and small microprocessors. Uh, welcome, Richard. Thanks. Yep, uh, very glad to have you. And, uh, you know, I want to spend our time together uh, talking about how the next generation of IoT devices, which will, of course, be processing at the edge, uh, are going to bring new demands for sensing, media processing, uh, and machine learning applications. But before we go there, a very general question to ease us into this. uh, What is driving uh, the trend toward real-time edge processing? Yeah, so I think the the trend follows the trend towards higher value use cases in IoT, and you know a lot of the um, the higher revenue that's being generated per device comes from processing of the data. So the data is the where the value is. Uh, at AWS, the trend is described as being fueled by three laws. So two two of the laws have a big impact. The third one, I would say, less so. But the first is the the law of physics. Uh, this is to do with the need to drive latencies down effectively. Um, now, if you think of uh, hot topics around machine learning at edge and this kind of thing, they're very processing intensive, and they just can't cope with the latency of going to the cloud and back. Uh, the second law is the law of economics. This is something we all understand, of course. Now, um, there is a cost to sending data. You, you can get a lot of value in IoT. Um, I mean, there's lots of ways you can get value, but at its most basic level, just storing all your data, all your global data in one place and in one format, rather than distributed around the globe in lots of different database formats, allows you to get a lot more visibility and insights into that data. But at the same time, if you're on an expensive communication link or your messaging costs are high, then the edge processing allows you to uh, pre-process, you know, to filter, to clean, remove, remove duplicates, and only send the data that actually gives you that insight and that value. So the value doesn't diminish, but your costs diminish by doing that edge processing. The third law, like I say, is a bit niche because it only covers a small number of use cases, and that's just the law of the land. If you're working in an industry where you you don't have the freedom to send the data where you want, uh, medical is the one that's always kind of highlighted there, but there are others. Uh, I would also add to that intermittent connectivity, uh, a lot of especially remote IoT operations, you know, if you're in a, in, a, in a mine, which is far away from civilization, you get intermittent connectivity, and that necessitates edge processing. So you can carry on executing even when the internet's not there. And then, you know, when you get connectivity back, you can resync with the cloud. That's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, uh, that excellent overview. Um, so with that, then how, how has this changed microcontroller uh, applications? Well, yes, <laughs> the microcontroller applications have been changing continuously in the 25 years that I've been, been doing this. Uh, and one of, the, one of the notable changes now, of course, is that microcontrollers are getting larger uh, because the software is getting more complex. Uh, obviously, the business models are, are changing as well. Um, the growth of IoT itself uh, was a big shift, I think, because of the, the new challenges that come with uh, the, the scale and the security requirements of IoT. So I think the differences specific to IoT uh, is just that edge processing in IoT use cases is a lot more involved. 
uh, not just because of the additional number of libraries uh, to be integrated, but also because it's multi, I always struggle to say this, multidisciplinary. Um, <laughs> So we, it's multidisciplinary in the sense that you've got the cloud and the edge. So the edge processing is obviously very different to the cloud processing, different skills required, but also in the edge processing itself. And this kind of generates knowledge gaps, if you like. Now there's, a, there's a couple of kind of use cases, which are high, hypothetical use cases that I, I kind of tell to make this point. And um, the first is regarding uh, motor control. And I choose motor control because you know, it's a very sophisticated but small. You can do an awful lot with a small amount of, of code. Um, and you, you can be the world's best motor control expert with, with more PhDs than fingers in implementing very tight control loops. Uh, maybe you're just writing in assembly because it has to be very fast. Right. And then um, I was just mentioning a moment ago you know, the, the business models that are opened up by IoT. So if you then want to add value to that with something like predictive maintenance, then you're going to have to have the actual predictive maintenance algorithms. Um, maybe if you're the PhD dude, then that's fine because that's very mathy and the motor control is very kind of mathy as well. But then you've got the connectivity as well. So uh, how, how are you then going to connect to the cloud? Okay, you've got a, a real expertise in one area, but this is to see where the, where the knowledge gaps come in. And I can kind of dem demonstrate this on, on a couple of diagrams here. So this, this first one is the structure of what that motor control application might look like, right? And you can see just how simple this is without, without connectivity. There's hardly anything there. You may have those drivers or you may not. And this second diagram shows the same thing, but this time with connectivity. And you can see the number of additional libraries. And these kind of cascade from each other. So first you have the base connectivity. This is the, like the TCP IP that everybody's aware of. Uh, and then the higher level protocols like MQTT. Um, and then you get into the more complex and uh, esoteric protocols like TLS for data encryption. So TLS is the protocol that everybody kind of uses every day, maybe without realizing it every time they do an HTTPS, it's using TLS to encrypt the data that it's, uh, that it's sending. Okay. And Important, and it's not just the encryption, but it's also the authentication. So um, if you are uh, an edge device and you're connecting to the cloud, you have to authenticate that you're connecting to the correct cloud. Likewise, the cloud has to authenticate that the device connecting to it is authorized to do that. So then that gets into the secrets you need to store on the device in order to enable that authentication. So you can see this kind of whole cascade I can flip that around a little bit and demonstrate this difference between what we call the, the differentiating functionality and the non-differentiating functionality. Great. If we, go, if we go to something like a light bulb, so in this diagram now, I'm showing this super duper fancy light bulb on the left-hand side. This does everything and more uh, you would ever want for a light bulb to do. I'm not saying here that light bulbs are a good, a good way of demonstrating <laughs> value in IoT, by the way. I'm just... <laughs> using a light bulb because it's the most base thing that everybody understands how simple it is. Sure. So maybe this is like flashing in time to music, fading in and out, presumably turning on and off at some point. On the right hand side, we have the, the program space. This is the memory map that holds the executable code. At the very bottom here, I have shown that very small kind of segment. That is implementing that, that differentiating functionality. What makes that uh, uh, you know, an all, all singing and all dancing? light bulb and then you can see all those other libraries i've just mentioned take up the entire rest of that program space and that's where the the complexity comes from and that's all undifferentiating you just have to have that in order to connect right and so i mean these are um obviously these these are de demands uh, pretty sizable demands that we are placing um on these types of devices and it, it's sort of like one side can't come up without the other. So what um, what is the maturity level um, of IoT adoption? How how is um, how are you seeing that um, uh, sort of evolving? Well, I'll say it, it's kind of uh, coming in phases. Uh, I mean, I think everybody understood the value of IoT very quickly. We're just talking about um, predictive maintenance, for example. That can save you a lot of money because you're not going out and servicing equipment that doesn't need servicing. 
and it can really please customers because their products or their you know their motor never breaks it, it tells you before it's going to break and gets fixed so you know the value is, is obvious um, and you know there, there's a kind of a rush towards it but then you know even even the embedded experts uh, not just the motor control experts but um, the the embedded software experts began to realize that you know perhaps this was a little a little harder than we had hoped for uh, and I think I just demonstrated some of the reasons <laughs> for that. You know, this kind of integration of undifferentiating functionality. Right. Yeah. And um, now I think the, those kind of integration challenges are largely behind us. Um, and what I, say, what, I'm, what I always describe as a kind of coming of age of IoT, because now those, those are being tackled. The, the challenges we're presented now are a lot more nuanced. And... Um, you know, people are kind of realizing that the the original problems, which we thought were harder, which were hard, are actually the the easier of the hard problems to uh, to fix. Right. I, you just used a very interesting uh, phrase that I you know my I tuned into right away. Uh, can you explain a little more what you mean when you say that this is the uh, coming of age for the IoT? Sure. So I think, um, like I just said, it's the it's the second round of challenges here. And I think security is the obvious one. So what I mean here is you've got, you've got the base functionality, TCP, and how you integrate that with TLS and all that kind of thing. And then um, when, you, when you look at the nuances of security, um, you know, we talk a lot about security, especially if it, IoT have physical access to devices, and a lot of IoT devices are useless if you don't have physical access, so that's just a, right. a given. Right. Um, there's a there's a lot written about securing IP, securing privacy, um, security from running malicious code, IP theft, counterfeiting. Um, but the, the more nuanced part that comes with that security is um, the the I kind of hinted at it already. This authentication, and that means that you need to make each device uniquely identifiable somehow in order to get that authentic authentication. Um, and that that throws up real practical challenges. Um, and this this customization, if you like, is what we call provisioning. So somehow not all devices are going to be going to be the same. Um, and I think the, the the one way I can describe this that everybody understands is um, when you buy a new device that maybe it's a cell phone or something like that, and you need to connect it to your home network. You need to give it the Wi-Fi password, so you're provisioning that device with right. that password. Uh, if you think about th that's a one-to-one -one interaction, and it's okay for that person to do it. But if you think about IoT, you might have hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices, and um, there's no what there's no one-to-one -one interaction. So somehow you need to customize those devices so they can uniquely authenticate themselves to the cloud and also understand which cloud is authenticating itself to it, so it doesn't just connect to anything. Um, so then, so that's the first challenge, but the real challenge then is, how do you, how do, you do that customization at, at huge scale? You know, IoT is all about scale. Exactly. Um, and, I mean, the scale is, is key, um, and part of the scaling, kind of in the same realm as as the complexities and um some of these these problems problems that we're solving for like you said maybe uh uh the motor control expert wasn't exactly um an ipv6 or networking expert right and so exactly um <laughs> provisioning a device ideally you're making it as easy as possible for the end user let's say it's a uh it's a smart factory or a smart building and we know that the person who's probably installing those devices and gateways might not be a double E. And, um, you know, in, in the case of maybe residential uh, water metering, they might be a, truly a plumber. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is that's not exactly in the profile of that trade is uh, provisioning devices, right? So we need to make, exactly. it, <laughs> need to make <laughs> it very simple for these devices to yeah. join a network securely and and everything else um a lot so this comes down to not exclusively but um majority is software so what's what would set software solutions 
uh, particularly uh, those offered by AWS. What would set these apart in terms of, say, cost, ease of use, uh, that sort of thing? Yes. So, um, but before just before I answer that, I should say that um, you know when we get these secrets onto the devices, the the software on the device has to manage those secrets as well. By manage them, I mean not expose them. And uh, you know, free, there's lots of different ways of doing this, and FreeRTOS is used with all of them. But the thing that's in common of all of them is the API we use to actually access those secrets. So we use something called uh, PKCS11. Uh, PKCS stands for Public Key Cryptography Standard. I got that right. And okay. um, th this is this is a global standard that's used used all over the place. And this you you require a bit of hardware support here as well. And this allows the software to access the, the secrets, which are normally private keys and certificates, without actually having to read them out. If you read them out and hold them in RAM, then they're exposed. So this interface allows you to access them just with handles, and they can stay within secure, secure hardware. Um, you know, there, are, there, there are lots of ways of doing this. I wouldn't say they're, they're just software, um, and, and there's a lot of research and um, uh, you know, new methods coming out uh, to do this. If you do, you know, the first thing you have to do really is decide when you're going to do this customization because you can do it when you manufacture the part, when you assemble the part, or after the part has been assembled and you first turn it on. If you do it at manufacture time, then you have the challenges of distributing those secrets to the manufacturer, how the manufacturer controls those secrets, how access to it during the manufacturing process and there are right. companies there are companies solving this problem um that we we've worked a long time with a company called IER they have this uh, secure things um, and they're actually building they, they have a whole development they're, they're famous for development tools and into that tool chain now they're developing this provisioning workflow but not just at the development tools but also to then distribute those keys and then inject them in a secure way now that um, you know, that adds to bomb cost, you know, obviously contract manufacturers are going to charge a little bit more. So as, as you say, there are lots of software ways of doing this as well. Right. So, so traditionally, there's something called a certificate signing request. Uh, so here, you would manufacture a device with a certificate on it, um, but then you have to trust that certificate. And to do that, you would sign that certificate. And again, this is, um, if you think of your web browser connecting to a bank, it obtains a certificate and it checks the signature against, uh, a, you know, there, there are a few companies in the world that are trusted as root uh, mm. to provide roots of trust and they sign that certificate. So what's happening in the background is that certificate is signed already and you're checking it. Uh, your, what your web browser checks it. And if, oh, okay. it, yeah. if, it if it doesn't trust it, then it'll tell you not to access your bank account or something. So. Um, that's about as simple as I can. It's a lot more complex than that. I'm trying to explain it simply. Right. Um, so a certificate signing request, the device has the certificate and it's then asking for it to be signed. To do that securely, you need to be able to uniquely identify the device still. And this is where, uh, coming back to how microcontrollers are changing, there are a lot of microcontrollers coming onto the market where you know, the manufacturers are, are cognizant of, of this and providing mechanisms of doing this. So. You can have a database of IDs of devices. You get a, a signature, uh, sorry, a certificate signing request. Check it, uh, make sure that that device is in your database and sign it and, and send it back. Uh, as far as Amazon specific ones, then there, there, there's actually a whole, a whole set. And um, I think each one kind of, they all fulfill different use cases, put it that way. Um, the first would be something called uh, just-in-time registration. Now, that's that signing certificate or the, the or the trusted certificate. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, if you're using just-in-time registration, you would upload that to AWS. You'd probably not have your root certificate there. You'd have a intermediary certificate. But the important thing is that's the trusted, the trusted uh, certificate. Yeah. That would sign the the certificates which are on your individual devices. But you still have to have a unique certificate on each device. Right. So when, that, when that device connects, it offers up, you don't have to register the device. That, this is the big thing. You don't have to pre-register the device. When it connects, it presents its certificate. And as long as it was signed by that trusted 
certificate, it's registered at real time. So this is a really big boon for you know, mass production, but you do need to still customize each, each device. There's also something called just-in-time provisioning, which is similar, slightly different workflow, but similar. Okay. Um, after that, so how, the next thing after that would be something called fleet provisioning by claim. So this builds on top because it means you don't have to have a unique certificate on each device. And the way this works, in fact, I, I can show you this little diagram of the workflow here. Sure, yeah. The way, the way this works is that you actually put the same certificate on each device. This is what we call a claim certificate. Um, now, the claim certificate doesn't allow that device to do anything other than go through a process of getting its real certificate. But the, the big boon is here that every, every device has the same claim certificate. Um, Per manufacturer, I don't mean every device globally, right. um, <laughs> per product family. Sure. Um, and, then, and then you can see in this workflow that it connects using this claim certificate. That's, that's recognized uh, and it goes through this workflow and out the other end pops its real certificate. And there, um, there's a, what we call a provisioning template. And the cloud side is responsible for generating the certificate using that template to say what that certificate uh, authorizes that device to do. For example, uh, which uh, endpoints can it connect to? When it's connected, what can it do? Uh, can it just send data or can it read data? And there's a whole load of other things. You know, there's a whole raft of cloud services that um, you can access and you can get very fine-grained permissions in order to do that. Sure. There's, a slight, there's a slight different way of doing that, which is called fleet provision by trusted user. In this case, the authentication comes from the user. So the user has a cell phone. They have the, the device there with them. So there's that trust because of the proximity between the two. Um, and what they do is they, auth they authenticate. Uh, and at the time that the user authenticates, it generates this claim certificate at real time, at runtime. The big thing here is that claim certificate then only lasts a short time. I think it's five minutes. And the cell phone sends it to the device. And then the process that we just showed on the screen kicks off from there. That's obviously um, you know, limited to the use case where there is this person who is uh, you know, customizing the devices as they're installed. That's more common than you might think. And, you know, building control systems are installed by operators, so they can do that. The final one then is what we call multi-account registration. Now this gets around having to upload that certificate, your, your own trusted certificate. So you can see how these things kind of build on top of each other. Right, um, right. This also allows you to, um, you know, rather than having to upload a certificate to one global region, you can have true you know, global product distribution. There, there are lots of ways to, to, there are lots of benefits this provides, but I realize I'm going on a bit here. So let me just describe one of them. Yeah, this um, is great, by the way. I'm, I'm, I love this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the best way to use multi-account registration is actually to use something that we call a secure element. There are lots of manufacturers that provide secure elements. These are uh, silicon components that are hardened, you know, they're tamper resistant, and they can come with a key in them already. And then you connect them to your microcontroller over some serial bus. And again, the software then, or at least our software, different ways of doing it, uses this PKCS11 to access the key. So there's various different layers of security here. Mm -hmm. um, now, it used to be that you could buy these with your certificates in them, but then that part number was unique to you. So that meant you had to buy a lot of these devices <laughs> in order to make right. it economically viable. Right. What multi-account or just one way that multi-account registration helps is that now you can buy these things, you know, 10 at a time because they're all the same because um, they're not now unique to you. What the multi-account registration allows you to, allows them to do when you, you know, these, you have millions of these on the shelf. You just buy 10. Uh, when you turn it on, it's going to connect to an account that understands who bought that device or which company bought that oh, device. Okay. And then what it can do is hand over the certificate to that end users, or it might be the middleman, or it might be the end user's account, and uh, authorize the device to connect to that other account 
Uh, it tells the device where to go and connect. And this, and this can repeat uh, as it moves around the globe or as it's sold from you know, the, the manufacturer to the distributor to the, to the end user. So here, I say it, it, this, is, this is very, very close to a kind of zero touch approach as far as, as far as the users are concerned. Obviously, the designers have to think about these things. Right. Yeah, that's <laughs> so uh, the complexity of this is staggering. Um, and again, it all comes down to scale. Like, you know, anybody can build a proprietary thing and, and have a limited number. Right. And, and many of these problems just kind of sort themselves out. <laughs> but when we're talking mass adoption and again, the IOT is is the, the success of the IOT is a function of how many devices can connect to it um, and, uh, you know, the security of the data. So with all those things in mind, you know, design engineers really have a lot on their plate when they're when they're trying yeah. to develop a platform such as this. Not the least of, of which being uh, future proofing. So how can design engineers future proof their edge processing devices, especially when all of this stuff, this technology is evolving uh, so quickly? Yeah, that's that's the key, isn't it? That, that things are evolving, evolving very quickly. Yeah. And I think one of one of the. Like the, the fundamental point here is that um, when you distribute uh, your devices, you don't have physical access to them anymore. Uh, you can ask people to go and plug in a USB you know, into their device and update it, but that's not a great user experience. So being able to update your device over the air is kind of fundamental because today, and by that, what, what I mean is it, you may have a new executable code that you want to send to that device. This is what we call over the air update. And that enables you to change all the software on there. I mean, you could even change from one cloud provider to another. And this is, you know, that's kind of future proofing, right? But the, the, I think the fundamental point here is that today's security technology, the, the cutting edge today is not going to be tomorrow's cutting edge. So uh, you are always going to have to uh, consider how you are going to update your devices, if for no other reason to patch, uh, you know, as uh, security is advancing. We were talking about TLS. You know, prior to that was SSL, and everybody used SSL. There's vulnerabilities found in it. People mm -hmm. moved to TLS. So who knows what's going to be there tomorrow? Um, uh, other than that, we've we've seen how IoT devices have a lot of undifferentiating functionality. So you want to reuse as much as possible. You don't want to keep reinventing that, especially with this knowledge gap. So I think the key is to do as little, <laughs> be as lazy as you can, uh, do as, uh, as little <laughs> customization engineering as, as absolutely possible while staying in control of your destiny. Um, using libraries that are pre-integrated and tested. We saw some diagrams of that before. In fact, if you remember this diagram here, where I showed all these different libraries, then you can go one step beyond that and say, OK, all these libraries uh, come together, but we can also get these libraries pre-integrated and pre-tested uh, and even qualified as, as functioning. Um, and if I if actually, if I switch to this next diagram, you can see how we can make people's lives much, much simpler. And in here, we're adding in the kernel as well, the free RTOS kernel, the scheduler, mm -hmm. uh, the real-time operating system, whatever you want to call it. That introduces yep. multi-threading. Uh, and that in turn then enables us to give a very, very simple application level uh, view of the code. Talk about over the air update, that's quite a complex process, but using this scheme and the multi-threading, uh, you can just start the over the air updates agent in the background, allow it to do its thing, you know, it downloads codes, checks the signature of the code as well. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we're checking signatures to make sure things haven't been tampered with um, and that they're authorized. Yeah. And then just uh, tells you when a new a new one you know, new executable is there. Um, so you know we can really simplify things by choosing things which are pre-integrated and pre-tested. And then you just add. Remember that the differentiating part we looked in that light bulb diagram. That's right. the bit you add. Um, but secondary to that, you know, use cases are so diverse. So when you when you use these libraries in an integrated form, you also probably want to make sure that you can use the libraries individually as well. Now, this is particularly important for very small microcontrollers that you don't want all that, you don't even want multi-threading, but um, 
if you think about what we call greenfield devices, these are devices that are in, they've been deployed already, but you want to update them for yeah. different forms of connectivity. Uh, so if, in this diagram here, what I'm showing is some of the work we are doing to take these integrations of libraries as we move more into the official free RTOS distribution, uh, we're actually, um, you know, kind of decoupling them and breaking them down to the most, the most basic functionality. And that then gives you the flexibility to use that by itself, like I say, on a very small microcontroller. Or you can then couple that in itself is completely decoupled from everything, including the operating system. You can then build on that with this kind of agent that I was just describing uh, and have just that piece of functionality with a simple interface. Or you can go the whole hog and have the complete integration. So this is the flexibility. So that's another thing for kind of future proofing. You don't know what your next application is going to be or in five years. Right. Right. Yeah. I think there, there's things like uh, open source can help biz with um, business risk mitigation. You may want to delegate the responsibility. You may want to buy rather than build. But I think, you know, IoT devices, they're in the field a long time. So if you do use a commercial vendor, you at least want to make sure you have access to the source code and you know how to build it and patch it just in case they're not there to help you. Mm -hmm. And finally, I think uh, choosing the cloud vendor is the same, right? Like I said, it's multidisciplinary, that word again. Uh, <laughs> so the same goes for the cloud. You want to make sure that your cloud vendor is able to keep up. They're able to scale, but the, the velocity at which they add features and the velocity at which they adapt is very high as well. Yeah. Um, There's this, a lot there. <laughs> there is, I mean, I, and so much of it is stuff that, um, uh, so much of it is stuff that is just truly unknown. Uh, like you said, we, we don't know what the landscape is going to look like in two years. We don't know uh, what, what weaknesses we haven't discovered yet. Um, use yeah. cases, business models, so the best you can do is uh, what what you're doing, which is enable sort of at uh, at a global scale um, the most flexible, secure, viable um, architecture to uh, to account for all of these things. It's um, <laughs> that's the only way to achieve scale. This is man, my head is spinning, and uh, <laughs> this has all been so insightful. I know that our audience has uh, has questions for you as well, Richard. So. Um, let's, let's take a few of those now. And by the way, for those of you watching all week long, when you're watching these live keynotes, uh, you can ask questions in real time by using the, uh, the chat widget there. So, uh, you know, let's start with this one. Uh, this is Paul from San Antonio and he asks, uh, how do you prioritize developments given free RTOS has wide use on all microcontrollers, big and small, but IoT needs relatively powerful microcontrollers. Right, so um, I would say that uh, free RTOS has, has always prioritized its development with whatever the, whatever the demands of the day are. And I, obviously there's a big demand for IoT now. Mm -hmm. But you know, FreeOTOS has a huge install base. And we, we're talking specifically about IoT here, but all the other use cases don't go away. So we prioritize the same way, prioritize the same way we always have. We're obviously investing a lot in IoT at the moment because that's the growing, the growing area. That's the, the volume area. Uh, you know, FreeOTOS is very, very customer driven. But say, is it customer? I don't know. With open source software, user, you know, it's user based, uh, <laughs> right. user based driven. Yeah. Um, so you, you you can look at you know our, our code is in GitHub, so you can go and have a look at some of the developments we've done. So you can see that the kernel is under active development. We're adding new features into the kernel. We're adding new architectures. We've just actually released a whole load of new demos for eight bit AVRs, um, AVR microcontrollers, uh, and that's you know there's nothing to do with um, nothing to do with IoT. Right. Uh, and I think you know now I'm working with. Um, with Amazon, who, who are being a fantastic sponsor and bringing all sorts of value uh, to the whole free RTOS user base, where we are able to uh, you know, concentrate on uh, many things at once. So we have a much larger team. So we've got teams working on IoT and teams working on kernel development. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very interesting angle as well. Some of the value that um, having 
a big backer and a you know a big sponsor like AWS bring because obviously they have an interest in in IoT, but there's a lot of work which is being done. Things like um, mathematical proofs for not just uh, thread safety, but um, you know, so memory safety, and uh, you know the kind of global presence that they bring. And it's 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 in, it's important to note that all these benefits are being added to code which is MIT licensed. So you know, there's no link. Uh, you don't have to be an AWS customer. Doesn't matter. I said that you know, there's huge install bases outside of IoT. And all that work with that larger team and all that um, you know, more focus on things like mathematical proofs is just available to, to everybody. So um, yeah. you know, if, you're, if you're slightly concerned that we're focusing on too much on IoT, just go and have a look and you'll see that you know, this larger team is bringing huge value to anybody, no matter what their use case or what they're, you know, even if they're connecting to a different cloud. That's a really good point. You know, the, the context of this discussion this morning is IoT, and that's kind of the parameters, but um, uh, for the most part, but um, I, that's a really good point. That And by the way, this is a completely impertinent question and not one from our audience, one from me. Uh, do you have like a slow gear? Because <laughs> like it occurs to me, I mean, you founded Free Artos, which is incredible. The, the being able to implement um, an open... Uh, real-time operating system on virtually every ma uh, microcontroller manufacturer you would want to have supported and then keep that supported and then now extending this into iot and doing it uh in conjunction with amazon i mean good lord you're <laughs> you're killing it as they say um so here's a here's a question from uh rahan in cologne hello in cologne uh good afternoon i should say uh rahan asks um what range of solutions do engineers have available to them for the implementation of edge processing in real time? Good question. Oh gosh, <laughs> there's um, an, there's an infinite number of solutions. I would say, uh, of course, there's a lot of um, you know, I, I'm I'm very much focused on microcontrollers, and you know, I suppose one. One extreme of solution is that you just go and uh, you know develop everything yourself. You, you can develop the 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 hardware even and the software without any pre-integrated uh, and provide your own cloud service. You know I, I would strongly recommend not doing that for the reasons we've just been through. You know you're doing all that <laughs> undifferentiating work that people who are experts in those fields have done for you. You know sure. right right to the other extreme of yeah, you know, big Linux system, which is um, you know very very, very powerful, uh, and you know very very common in in edge processing as well, especially in things like gateways. Um, if if I can narrow it down to AWS, and obviously you know emphasizing the point that there are a huge number of options here, but uh, at AWS we have uh, many many different SDKs with software development kits, which are uh, in, in lots of different languages, you know, Python and Node and all these different things. Uh, we have obviously um, free RTOS, which we've spent a lot of time talking about. There's a, a CSDK, which is uh, RTOS agnostic as well. And cool. uh, as time goes on, we're sharing more libraries there. So a lot of the refactoring work that I've been talking about is going to apply to the CSDK and free RTOS. Mm -hmm. There's um, a product called uh, Greengrass. Now, Greengrass is not an operating system, but it runs on Linux. That enables you to, um, well, it enables you to do lots of things. I, I'm, I'm, I'm underselling it here, so you should go and read about it. But a few <laughs> things that allows you to do is take some of those cloud services and actually move them to the edge. I mean, this is, uh, you know, very pertinent to the first question about, you know, how. Yeah. Um, yeah, how the things are being driven to the edge. So a lot, a lot of the you know, the cloud services you you can develop in the cloud and run on the on the edge now using Greengrass to get access to some of those AWS features. Uh, but more than that, it allows you to run, you know, you know manage, run, deploy, monitor, uh, lots of different applications. You know, particularly in things like uh, containers. So it's not just AWS services. You you can use the device management and the provisioning and that kind of thing, but then just run your own applications 
in the green grass environment as well. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, and that you said that runs, uh, I'm not familiar with it at all. It runs, uh, on, on Linux. Yes. All right. Yes. That's all right. I am going to go check that out. <laughs> um, but first a uh, couple more Lara, uh, from Markham, uh, presumably Ontario has a, has an interesting question, uh, because we were, uh, um, we were just talking about this a little bit. She says free RTOS is used, uh, with all cloud services can we expect this playing field to stay level with uh, AWS now being involved? Uh, in, in the reality, the, yeah, well, so the reality is is yes. Um, the the reason I say the reality rather than some of the perception, uh, you know, AWS are obviously sponsoring a lot of the work, so we have a lot of examples which are connecting to AWS, and um, there's a lot of we can we can draw a line between what is open standards. In fact, when we were talking about future proofing, what I should have also spoken about is open standards. So there's in FreeRTOS, we always make sure that we are using open standards. You know, TLS is not something which is particularly suited to a microcontroller space, but we use it because it's an open standard um, and it's trusted um, much more than if we were to write something our ourselves. So sure. Um, Things like TCP, which we're doing a lot of, you know, again, we're doing memory safety proofs on TCP. Um, and some of our examples are connecting to AWS, but we also have examples which are connecting to completely neutral places. There are some public uh, MQTT, which is a, another protocol which is used a lot in IoT. So we're connecting to, um, what was it called Mosquito, which is a completely neutral MQTT broker as well. So there's so it's, you know, it's MIT licensed. There's a lot of work going into it. It's open standards. You can connect to anything you like with it. The other side of that is the AWS specifics. So the, there's less portability in the clouds, of course. And, and of course, we are keen to demonstrate some of the real value add in AWS. So um, over the air update, there's a fully managed over the air update service and some of the uh, device you know, the fleet provisioning that we spoke about this is mm -hmm. kind of um aws specific and we've done we've done a lot of work to hopefully demonstrate that we are still yeah you, know, you can still connect to any cloud you like by deliberately separating these two uh, and in fact in, in this diagram here you can see how the generic protocols i'm not sure how to describe them the standard protocols are being moved into the freeartos.org Git repo. This is a slightly expanded uh, view of the diagram I showed before. And the AWS specifics are, are separated out. So um, is it still a level playing field? Yes and no, in the sense that we're doing mm -hmm. a lot of examples that connect to AWS, but you can take that and connect to anything you like. Uh, FreeRTOS has always been open and neutral. And right, right. Um, no, that's... Uh, that's really good. I, there is that big, there is sometimes that pers that gap, right, between um, what's real and happening versus perception and, and sort of assumptions. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, that was that was really interesting. Uh, so last, we have time for one more. Uh, this is Andrew. He's in Crystal Lake, Illinois. Um, Andrew has a good question here. So uh, uh, Richard, what are your predictions for the next few years in IoT? Ah, great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I could talk. I could talk about this. I, I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Otherwise, I, I, I could do a whole half hour on this. Um, <laughs> so, well, every, everything starts. Well, some, some, some things you can see happening already. So, I'm going to distinguish between what you can see happening and and the predictions. So, cool. The first is an increase in coordinated attacks on IoT devices. I mean, it's well known now that there are legacy devices in the field that don't have great security. Uh, and you can say that's a bad thing, or you can also say it's a good thing. So that leads on to, or the, that prediction is perhaps somewhat obvious because something you can see in the field already is an increase in legislation, okay, uh, to protect consumers and consumers' data. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that already. It's not really a prediction, that part of it, but um, developers are then forced, because of that legislation, to actually do you know, due diligence on security. 
um, which in, then you know, in, increases the need for doing a lot of these things that I was talking about provisioning at scale. So that's going to become more and more important. And I think also developers are going to increasingly realize that device side security is, is perhaps not always enough in itself. Hmm. If you have physical access to devices, um, then you know, with enough motivation and enough equipment, uh, eventually things will will get broken. This is where the the, you know, the the need to update as well comes in. We've also we've also spoken about. It. So my next prediction is there's a there's an in, increased amount of coordination or responsibility between device side security and cloud side security. So the cloud side security. Um, can do things like audit devices, make sure they're set up correctly, audit how they're behaving just in, in case you know, there's some, some malicious code running on there. It mm. can monitor, monitor whole fleets of devices and look for patterns. Uh, it can then like, close the loop and update devices. It can take devices offline if they think they're behaving in an anomalous way. So I think this, this synchronization between cloud and device security is going to become you know, more and more important over time. Um, and that then leads to, in, you know, that, that forced um, need to think about security and all this innovation which is going on now, both on the device and this, uh, on the cloud and the coordination between the cloud and device will over time increase people's confidence in, in products. Um, and that uh, will, will increase adoption. So you can see a kind of cycle here. Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, key learnings uh, from the prior six months or the prior 18 months obviously inform sort of where the industry uh, collectively goes next and, and, and subsequently. And like you said, uh, the more these uh, devices become ubiquitous, um, commonplace and consumers are, are um, you know, I, I, I see the occasional scare article about, uh, you know, um, what is your smart speaker really listening to? It's like, I, <laughs> none of us uh, really, there's, there's probably a handful of people in the world that, that truly understand the rest of us are just speculating. Right. So the more that we have good experiences and, and good trusting relationships with these types of devices, um, you know, the, uh, the more this scales. And then uh, again, these, <laughs> that's why we're engineering for scale now. Um, you know. So this has been, yeah. this has been amazing. Uh, like you said, uh, I feel like an hour wasn't long enough um, and, and a really fun way for me to uh, kick off this particular week long event, Richard, thank you so much. And uh, thank you all yeah, for well, joining us. Yeah. And by the way, um, let's do this again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, hey, if you're watching this uh, live, you know, you've got a full day of live sessions ahead of you. Uh, it's not just this one. So be sure to reach out and connect with other attendees throughout the day, including the presenters, by the way. Uh, they'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'm going to uh, be on there as well. So enjoy your day, everybody. Richard, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been great. You bet. And uh, for those of you at home, we'll see you tomorrow. 